Welcome to the Habits and Hustle podcast, a podcast that uncovers the rituals, unspoken habits, and mindsets of extraordinary people. A podcast powered by Habit Nest. Now here's your host, Jennifer Cohen. I want to just start by saying, I thought, honestly, when I started to read your books, I, I assumed that you were probably like 50 or 60 because I didn't, I, I didn't realize that you're like a 33-year-old guy because you have so many best-selling books, like New York Times best-selling books. I was like, this guy can't be really just 33 years old. And I, I, I get that a, a fair amount. I definitely feel old, but uh, I happen oh, to not Oh, absolutely not. In fact, when I, even looking at you, you look like you're 11 years old. Like you don't even look 33. So <laughs> before, besides the fact that you look really young and you are really young, it's a pretty huge accomplishment that you've written this many books. So, you know, bravo. Well, thank you. No, you're, you're welcome. So did you, I guess, well, I'll, I'll do a proper intro, you know, later on uh, af- after this. Okay. But, um, cause I want to get right into it with you. Cause I've got so many questions for you and I know that we have like a very finite period of time. All right. Well, I, I guess I'm just more curious. Did you ever think when you started down this path of, you know, stoicism from all your books, the obstacles, the way ego is the enemy, the daily stoic, uh, and you know, stillness is the key. This, the new book, which, which is of course, uh, the one that we're even here talking about, uh, the lives of, what's it called? Lives of the Stoics. Right? Mm-hmm. Uh, did you ever think that all these books would have such a broad appeal to so many different walks of life, from entrepreneurs, business people, tech people, uh, parents, uh, and everything kind of in between? No, I, th- I think that would have been insane, probably, to think <laughs> that. Um, and and I was actually just talking to my my editor about this at at, at Portfolio. I, I finally sort of worked up the courage to ask. I was like, Hey, what did you think? When I came to you guys, because my first two books had been about marketing, and I said, "What did you think when I said, hey, you know, for my next book, I want to write about this, you know, obscure school of ancient philosophy?" And she was saying, "You know, we we didn't hate the idea, but we kind of hoped you would you would maybe just get this out of your system, and then you could go back to what you really should be writing about." So I think even even my own publisher thought like. They were basically just humoring me, is what is what she was right. saying, and 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 I, I mean, I was very serious about the idea, and and I thought it could work, but I think one of the really tricky things about taking a gamble or a risk is that you can, after it's worked out, tell yourself that you knew it all along or that it was obvious. I think I, I don't, so I try not to do that. I. I I really just have always loved the philosophy. It had such a big impact on my life. And it was just the thing I was most interested in. And, and, and it was the idea that I happened to have at the time. And, and the rest kind of uh, took care of itself. Well, that's interesting because I, when I started doing some research on you, when, I, when obviously when we booked this podcast, you know, I just assumed that you were a philosophy major and that you were just, you know, you were just that's who you were. I had no idea that you came from a marketing background. You were like running marketing for American Apparel. Right? Is mm-hmm. that what you're doing? Yes. And then, and then you wrote all these. You you started as like kind of like a media manip. You wrote about media manipulation. Yeah. So, and and I think that worked out to my advantage in in two respects. So one, uh, not being a, a a sort of a classically trained philosopher, I was much more interested in the practical benefits of it, and I wasn't so uh, consumed or or distracted by the theories. And, and what's really weird is actually Marcus Aurelius 2000 years ago talks about even then how tempting it is to be caught up in these, in the ideas of it and the, the abstraction of it and to, to miss the point, so to speak. But, but I, then I think my marketing background helped me in the sense that when I sat down to write this book, I said, okay, I believe this philosophy is true. I believe it can have a huge impact for people. However, I also am well aware of just how resistant people are are to even that word philosophy, let alone stoic philosophy, which is probably the most unappealing phrase in the English language. You know, it, that people think that means sort of like, uh, you know, emotionlessness, and they think it means, you know, again, abstraction. And so I think my sense that like, hey, even though I'm, I'm really passionate about this, most people aren't. So if I want to take this idea and make it accessible to people, it's going to be hard and I'm going to have to attack it from a certain angle. And so I, I think 
you know, when I talk about the obstacle being the way, I'm not just talking about obstacles, these sort of big life changing adversities. I'm just talking about you go to solve a problem, you can use some of the disadvantages to your advantage if you are creative enough. Yeah. And I, you know what? I, it's, you, what you do two things very well. Like you make it very practical. Like you said, you, t- you, you meet people where they are. So I think that's also what you said. Like that's what the broad appeal to me, I think, is. You know, even in stillness, you know, your, your last book, it was about, you didn't talk about meditation, which everyone assumes if you want to be present, if you want to be still, you must meditate. And so I actually didn't even want to even read that book because right. I thought, oh, oh God, this is, I know exactly what this is about. And then a friend of mine actually uh, got it for me. And he's like, you know, it's not at all what you're going to think it is. It has nothing to do with meditation. And like, but that's what you do very well. You kind of make it so even it's from 2000 years ago, it does really the information, the the four pillars of what the virtue that what they stand on is so applicable to today's to, to anybody's life. And you can really, you know, use it as a guide for like living well. Well, th- thank you. I mean, look, I, I like to think of myself as a regular person. And so I, I'm not that interested in ancient philosophy, right? Like, I mean, I'm very right. interested in it. But at the same time, like, like, if somebody starts throwing a bunch of words at me that I've never heard before, or they're, t- they're talking about something in a totally theoretical context, or, or all of a sudden, it's gotten very far from any practical application, you know, my, my eyes start to glaze over and I tune out. And, and it right. definitely was stillness. I mean, like, the amount of people that have told me that I should meditate, the amount of meditation apps that I've tried, you know, the amount of of, of classes I've been, all, and yet I I can't seem to make it a habit. And so, right. but but oftentimes what people will do, my, my friend uh, Ramit Sethi is a is a financial blogger, and he talks about how almost all personal finance advice begins with start a budget, and he's like. But then if you look at the research, nobody keeps a budget. Rich people don't keep budgets. Poor people don't keep budgets. People who care about personal finance don't keep budgets. Even personal finance writers and personalities don't keep don't keep budgets, right? So it's, like, yeah. it's very disingenuous to go tell people to do a thing that you yourself are not going to do or to talk about it in a way that that assumes or pretends that the reader or the audience is somehow you know, beneath you and therefore they need the advice, but you of course don't need the advice. And so one of, that's one of the things I think about with books is like all my favorite books, what are they filled with? Stories. All my favorite books have stories. Yeah. The only thing I remember from any books I've ever read are stories and then the occasional quote and then anecdotes, which are sort of halfway between a quote and a story. And so really when I think about doing books, I try to build them around that. And, and, the other thing I think about, um, and, and this is something I disagree with a lot of authors on, I also think I am much less interesting than most historical figures who have ever lived. So if it's a choice between a story from my boring life or a story from Marcus Aurelius's life or a story from you know my friend Steve's life, and Napoleon, I'm going to pick Napoleon and I'm going to pick Marcus Aurelius. So, so I, I also just try to think, you know, if I was a reader and I didn't care about this, and that's the truth. Most people do not care about you, what you're doing. They don't care about your life's work. They're not that interested. And so if you want to reach them, you have to figure out a way to get over and through all those reservations. So that's sort of what I build my works around. And how did you know this? Because like I said, you're super young. You're not like, you're not like this old wise man that's lived a long, long life, right? But yet you keep on turning out like one amazing book after another, after another. And it's, and, and what's so, and it wasn't like we just said earlier, it wasn't only because it was all about like taking these stories from these, uh, these philosophers. I mean, you did it before with your other books. Like, did you, how did, did you always just innately have a knack though for understanding human nature like that? And getting it really quickly what people need and and your marketing background that's why you were probably good at that i don't know i mean i i think uh there's i, I think uh you know an athlete tends to have a natural aptitude that then is invested mm-hmm. in and then uh and then the the amount of drive that they have or their their willingness to approve improve or get feedback it sort of all adds up uh 
into some form of mastery or the ability to do the the task well. So I feel like I always loved reading. I always loved stories. I, I think there was a part of me that was just looking for advice. So I sort of was naturally just that's what I was gravitating towards when I was reading. And and then I got really lucky in that um, instead of training as a writer, like instead of going to mm-hmm. to uh, you know the Iowa Writers Workshop or getting an MFA somewhere where I would have been much more schooled in the craft of stringing words together. I ended up uh, training as like a research assistant to a great writer, Robert Greene, who I, I think you had on, right? Um, I had him on a couple of times and we're, we're I'm actually very close friends with him. That's how I got to you. Yes, right, right. He's the one who recommend, well, not just recommended, he didn't have to recommend you. He's the one who I basically said, I want to have your guy on, make it happen. <laughs> well, well, that that was the, the big break in my career and in, in that it allowed me to sort of, you know, there's this great expression, uh, any fool can learn by experience. Um, I've been I've been very lucky in that I got to learn from the experiences of someone like Robert Greene. So, you know, I was sitting here writing this morning and the very research methods that I'm using on my book now, I learned for Robert and and so or from Robert. And and so, uh, I mean, there's uh, 40 ounces of power in human nature. Yeah, I'm looking at it. Um, but but I'm looking at it. I, I got I got sort of trained in the art of doing that sp- specifically or explicitly. And, and, and that was a, a huge breakthrough for me. So I really went into it um, with, with a huge break in that sense. How, what, is, what is your method for researching so well? Because obviously well, so, you're yeah, doing so, it well. So, well, thank you. <laughs> uh, so, and Robert actually just posted a picture of his note cards on, on, uh, on Instagram the other day. Basically, it starts on four by six note cards you sort of you read books and you break down the material from those uh, books onto the note cards and you accumulate and you accumulate and then you sort and organize and so uh, I'm in the middle of a book now and I'm moving all these pieces around and and you know I had uh, the 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 stack of note cards for the 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 chapter that I'm writing today um, so so it's this kind of process of researching synthesizing and then and then building using those as building blocks for for your own writing. Wow. I mean, it's, it, it's, I think I should try that. I saw that in one of your, I think you were doing like a Google talk or something like that. And that was, and you mentioned something about those. I didn't realize that was actually your process of yeah. researching to write a book. Yes. So, wow. Okay. So of all cases, okay, so now that you've like, I mean, and also this, your new book is so long, so big. I mean, like, <laughs> it's like 700 and what, 12 pages. I mean, I don't it's, know it's about that. A, it, it's you know seven, it's a it's a long book. I mean the way I have it because I have it on a on. Oh, it's um, a PDF or something, right? A PDF, yeah. yeah. For me, it's a PDF. So um, I would, but I'm thinking to myself, just the amount of re. I guess you've basically done this so much in this in this space that you kind of are like gathering about a lot of the information. Um, but what I loved about this particular book is that it was it's very it's like you're making these um these philosophers, very real, like real people, you're humanizing them, right? Yeah. It's not just like looking at a word and saying, okay, this is a quote. And it's like, you're, you're kind of creating them, like you're looking at their actions, what they're doing day to day, which of course I love because that's how, you know, like you said, it's the, it's the practical element where I feel like someone, I can relate to the person. Yeah. Um, no, oh, it's, it's no, no, it's funny. Like I, I actually have not seen the book yet because of the pandemic. Like normally I would have seen, I would have had physical interactions with sort of rough <laughs> drafts and galleys. So I, I don't even have the book yet it, and I'll, I'll probably get it in about a week or so before it comes out. So we're kind of all in uncharted territories. When you said that it was 700 pages, I was like, oh my God, I hope I didn't write a 700 page book. That, that doesn't sound very appealing, but uh, yeah. it, I think it's shorter than that. I hope. But, oh, but, I'm sure it is. The way I'm looking at it, it looks like that. And right. but also, it's a kind of book. I don't think it's a bad thing because you can use this book as a reference point. Like you can kind of go back and forth, and it's not like one. You can like read one uh, one person. What you can read Zeno, for example, one of the yeah. sto- one of the Stoics. Then you can read, uh, you know, I call them cleanse cleansy. What do you call? What's his name? Cleansy. Glancius, okay, sorry, I'm not as versed as you are. You can you can kind of like go back and forth when when needed. So that's what I like about those kind of books too. Yeah, no, it's it's definitely designed to be modular. And and on my book, The Daily Stoic, we did a similar thing where you read one page a day. I, I really do like self-contained uh, sort of modular uh, writing. But but to your point about humanization, I mean, it is interesting. 
that we say that because it sort of implies that they weren't humans to begin with. Like we have such a strange relation relationship right. with the ancients where we we think that because they lived a long time ago, they that that humanity was somehow fundamentally different. And there were a lot of things that were different, but you know, um, I, I, I was thinking about this uh, recently. Um, I mean, Marcus Aurelius wrote Meditations during the Antonine Plague, which was a fifteen year uh, global pandemic that originated in in China, was spread by the military, and and ends up sort of devastating Rome, and and it it it, it, it creates inordinate amounts of stress and chaos and sadness and tragedy, and 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 so I mean, what he was waking up and experiencing was the ancient Roman way of exactly what we're waking up and experiencing. And, 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 and we, we like to think that the past was so different, but, but it really wasn't. And I mean, I open uh, the, the preface of stillness is the key. Seneca is sitting in his apartment. He's got the windows open because it's hot and he's trying to write and concentrate and he can't because his neighbors are being too noisy and there's a police disturbance downstairs and there's, you know, there's, He's he's being disturbed by carriage noise instead of car noises, but but fundamentally is describing the exact same thing as someone living in Los Angeles or Rio de Janeiro or New York City, right? Um, yeah. It's just it's just how noisy life is and how distracting that is, and and so people were fundamentally people and they always have been, and so what I'm trying to do in lies is is say like, okay, we can learn a lot from what these people said, but what did they do? You know. Um, Seneca is offered a job in Nero's administration and he's struggling with whether to accept it. And he and he, he rationalizes that he should do it because, you know, he can he, he can contain the worst impulses of him and that he's trained for this. And, and maybe there's these these political things he wants to accomplish and and it's very flattering and blah. And it's like, well, what does that sound like? Right. That sounds like the exact dilemma that politicians are struggling with right now and from 2016 to 2020. So, so again, people are people and and we've been struggling with the same things. And that to me is what philosophy is really about. It's funny you mentioned uh, Seneca, because I think he's the most relatable to modern time, right? Because he was a senator, he did, and like, he was very ambitious. And I mean, just from like the, you know, I'm not schooled, like I said on you, but from what I kind of like got from most of them, but you know who you talk about a lot? I don't know if you've ever noticed this, but Marcus Aurelius, you mention him all the time. Of course. Is he your is he your favorite? Is he like your favorite? Or do you resonate with him the most? I, I do resonate with him the most. I sometimes I call him Marcus uh, because he's been <laughs> such a, an integral part of my life. Your and, life. And and what's what's so this is this is uh meditations here, uh his your favorite book. So my favorite book, and this is my favorite translations by by Gregory Hayes. But I was I was 18 or 19 years old. I, I hadn't even met Robert yet. And and uh, I, I bought that book and it, it you know it came on Amazon and and uh, I just read it and it's this incredible document because it's really a peek inside the brain of the most powerful man in the world at that time. And Marcus is writing, he has no idea that that's ever going to be published. He's not even writing like, hey, today, you know, I had a sandwich and then I, you know, I fell asleep. He's writing like about losing his temper and he's writing sort of admonishments to himself about how to be better. So it's they're really more like aphorisms or or um, uh, yeah, yeah, they're like aphorisms and maxims about who who he wants to be, how he wants to be, what the right thing is, you know, who he doesn't want to be like. There's even a big extended section of all the things he learned from people in his life and he just wanted to get it all in one place. So so that book was just so formative for me and and, and I returned to it over and over and over again. And and it's because I think it's it's so short and kind of cryptic that it, it really just allows you to he even talks about this in meditations. You know, he says, uh, you never step in the same river twice. And 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 I think every time you pick up the book, depending on what's going on in your life, you get something different out of what he's saying. And I was just reading it last night before bed. And I was like, you know, this is a copy I've had for 15 years and I've marked almost everything on the page except for this little thing. And it struck me, you know, in a different way last night and I wrote it down and I'll probably do something with it. 
That's amazing. So you basically, how many times do you think you've read that whole book? I mean, well into the hundreds. It's it's not really a book that you necessarily have to read uh, cover to cover. It's like um, self-contained. Like, is that s- same thing? Yeah. I mean, like here, I'll just open or just read you one. Um, uh, so this is a uh, book ten, number four. If they've made a mistake, correct them gently and show them where they went wrong. If you can't do that, then the blame lies with you or with no one. And so they're just like little sentences like that. And they're all numbered. Um, it really, the right translation is really key. Some of the other translations aren't as accessible, but you know, it, that's just an, inc- just think about the person who wrote that commanded the most powerful army in the world, the, right. the largest empire in the world was, was there was literally something called the, the cult of the emperor. There was literally a, a cult that worshiped the emperor as a God. He could put people to death you know, thousands, when he would head out in the streets, thousands of people would cheer him. Uh, every pleasure you could imagine was his. Um, and so he, he was in every sense all powerful. And yet he's writing in his diary at night that if he can't, you know, uh, uh, kindly convince someone of the error of their ways, then he's the problem, not them. I mean, that's just incredible. So I liked him. I really liked him too, because he's all about, ha- I mean, I like what he his practices, his habits he does every day. Um, I, and I want to, I will look, I'm going to ask you about them because I actually okay. relate to all of them except one, which okay. is the one that says he eats to live. He, he doesn't eat to, he lives to, he eats to live, not lives to eat, which of yes. course me being a Jewish girl, you know, <laughs> I, 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 all I do is the opposite. But um, the thing that I found super interesting about him, he's the one who also said that you have to practice you are what you do every day. So you have to practice being excellent every day. Sure. And I just, because of course this podcast is habits and hustle, anything that, that goes with anything that I, I hear that kind of triggers that habit thing, I, I, I of course kind of like l- latch onto, but um, he says journaling is a really big one, right? Mm-hmm. To, for, for, and I want to, you, you also believe in journaling every yeah. day, right? Yes, I mean meditations is Marcus Aurelius's journal, right? And and uh, and so yes, very big on journaling. Uh, I, I think habits go to the core of what Stoicism is. Like it's not this thing that you just read and then you magically are transformed. It's not like a religious awakening. It's much more an ongoing process. And and so when you read meditations, what's really interesting is how often he's repeating things mm-hmm. to himself. He's having to to remind himself, hey. You know, what about this? What about this? You forgot about this. Uh, I think that's a big part of it. Um, Zeno is the founder of Stoicism. He has a great line, which I think about as far as habits go. He says, you know, well-being is realized by small steps, but it is no small thing. And and I think that's, to me, really what habits are about. It's it's about, uh, you know, James Clear calls them atomic habits. Mm-hmm. What are those little that things that have an enormous impact on your life? And And yeah, whether it's waking up early to journal, whether it's, you know, deciding that you're not going to drink anymore, or it's deciding to, to, you know, like a a basic little habit I have that sort of keeps me sane is I don't touch my phone for the first one hour that I'm awake at a minimum. And so I have one hour of time to journal, time to spend time with my kids. I can like, when I'm, when I'm, when I get in the shower in the morning, I'm not thinking about emails that I've gotten. I'm thinking about whatever has, has, uh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking in the shower having, you know, not touched my phone since 10 o'clock at night. And so I'm, I'm starting the day from a clear place. I'm not, uh, I'm not starting the day from my back foot or I'm not, you know, Donald Trump is not in my head because when I woke up at 2 a.m. to go to the bathroom, I checked my phone and I saw something that the president tweeted. Do you know what I mean? Like, right. I, I have clarity and ownership over my own mind. And that's really important. Well, when you have kids like I do, too, it's not so easy because, you know, you have a lot of distraction from them. So, yeah. you know, waking up and I think you do this as well, but waking up early and being being that creature of habit that you wake up at the same time. 
you know, ev- around the same time every day kind of like also helps with that, right? For me anyway, sure. I don't know what time you wake up. What time do you wake up in the morning? So I, I woke up this morning at like 6.10 uh, cause that's when my, so I used to wake up early on purpose. Now I don't really set an alarm cause my kids are gonna wake me up uh, at an early time. I don't, I don't have to worry right. about it. But, but so the first thing I, I, w- I woke up, uh, my wife had been up with them at some time in the middle of the night. I knew this, so it was my turn. So I took both kids. Uh, we waited for it to get a little bit light outside. And then we went on a three mile walk together. Um, and we were just outside for close to an hour. Uh, I was active. We saw the sun come up. We talked. Um, and and so like, wow. you know, I, obviously I've been at work uh, since then, but it's like I started the day with, you know, an hour and a half of like quiet time with my kids. Like I, I'm in a good place, right? I, I could have spent that time checking my email. I could have spent that you know, if it wasn't a pandemic, maybe you would have scheduled the breakfast meeting. I, I like to preserve that morning time for myself, for my for my important creative work and for my family. And then everything else, like I'll probably be done for the day around like two or three o'clock. Um, and and if if I have to catch up on stuff, sure. But but I've already done all the important stuff for the day. Right. So always like so make your morning where you do all the important things. So like all the all the really important tasks should be done in the morning. Uh, like I think was this also was that I don't know if that was Marcus Aurelius' thing, but I know that that was one of the things that you, I saw you talk about as well. Um, now we, we you said something though that was that I wanted to touch upon, which was uh, getting to like the good habits. And yeah. then how about break? What what did the Stoics say, or what uh, what what can they? What have you kind of gleaned from them? from all the stories of how to break bad habits. So it's one thing to make a good habit, but how sure. do you break a bad habit? Yeah, I mean obviously that's that's a that's the trickier part. I mean one of the things I think you 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 do is you start small. So like let's say I'm I'm addicted to my phone, which like all people I am. I started I I started I said, "Hey, look, I'm going to I'm going to not touch my phone for the first 10 minutes that I'm awake." Right? So that's what I started. I actually used an app called Spar, which I love. Um, and I did a group. It was like a challenge group with people, and you had to check in after the ten minutes or whatever. And if if it was on the honor system, but the point is, if you mess up, if you miss a check in, it, it charges you like ten bucks or something. Um, so I, I, mm. I so I started I started small. I started ten minutes, and then I went to thirty minutes, and then I went to an hour. And and after you know a year of of sort of explicitly building the habit, it becomes a muscle memory. And now I like now it's like I have to remember to grab my phone on the way out of the house in the morning because right. it's not a part of my morning. Like it's just not, it's not, it's not what I built my morning around. I built my morning around all these other things. So and that actually is something Epictetus talks about. You know, he's like, one of the best ways to break a habit is to, is to build a different habit, right? To, right. to, to sort of put your energy, instead of just going, I'm not going to do X anymore. I think it's it, it can sometimes be better. I'm going to do Y instead, and to focus your energy constructively building something up rather than than trying to sort of break something by force. And then, what else? Other ways that you can build build a good habit or break a bad habit besides uh, starting small with baby steps. Give me another yeah. way. Sure, sure. Um, I think so. So as part of the 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 morning, uh, you know, the morning routine we talked about. But then the other part of Seneca's sort of routine is in the evening. There's like a review. So he's like right. sort of maybe in the morning. Here's what I'm trying to do. Here's who I want to be. This is my goal. You know. Uh, and then the after in the evening, he sort of says, you know, after my wife has gone to bed, after the house is quiet, I sit and I put the day up for review. And so like, that's something uh, I, I tend to, I tend not to do it so much in the, oftentimes in the morning, I'm reviewing the day that just passed, but same idea, which is you set your intention and then you evaluate how you compare to that intention, just in the way that a, a football team breaks down film of the game. How did you do, right? Uh, why mm-hmm. did you, you didn't do what you were supposed to? Why is that? What's your excuse? So on and so forth. Um, so, so like, for instance, I'm someone who gets like anxious when I fly. Uh, not not like I'm anxious of flying, but clearly I am anxious because uh, I end up, you know, being very rushed. I end up being, you know, uh, getting into arguments. I take everything too seriously. And so so what I'll often do is it's so, OK, you're you know, you're leaving for the airport in an hour. And so I'm writing about this in the morning. You know, 
it's going to be delayed. Uh, you know, let's think about this in advance. You know, here's here's like sort of actually trying to describe to yourself what you don't want to do or what you do want to do, whatever it is. But then you actually have to take the uncomfortable step afterwards of doing the debrief, right? Doing yeah, the debrief. evaluation. You can't just go, hey, you know, I'm trying to eat healthier. And then, and then, you know, you just eat whatever the fuck you want. And you, six weeks later, you're like, why have I not lost any weight? It's like, well, what did you eat yesterday? And if, you, if you're checking in with yourself about how you're doing, I think it keeps you uh, on track. It keeps you accountable. So that's also why I think journaling can be play such a big, important role, right? Because you are, you're, you're seeing day to day what you said the other, you know, you basically yes. are keeping a track of what you're, what you're thinking and what you're saying and how you're feeling. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. Right? Mm -hmm. You, what was that? I think I saw something you had like, and I wanted to ask you because you, you had a journal. I, I don't like, again, I don't know where yeah. I saw this, you mentioned it, but you write one sentence a day in something, which I think is a really good way for people who are not, you know, accustomed to journaling to start because it's, again, it's, a, you're starting small. Yeah, what kind no, of book was that? Or so, so, uh, so I totally wish that that's how I'd started journaling because it, it would be so cool to, to have. But I found it only a few. I think I found it three and a half years ago because I'm three oh. and a half years in. But it's called uh, the One Line a Day Journal, and there's a whole bunch of different ones. There's the one One Line a Day Journal for moms, and there, there's interesting ones. But yeah, it's just one line a day. And so what, what's really cool for me as a writer is like. You know, yesterday when I was doing and I was like, you know, I'm, you know, starting part two of, you know, the book that I'm working on now, which I won't say, but it happened that <laughs> that, that almost exactly one, uh, that exactly one year ago today, I was in the middle of, uh, actually two years ago uh, yesterday, I was in the middle of part two of stillness. And so I just write one sentence every day. It's mm. kind of like what I'm working on, what's going on. And it gives me um, it, 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 it just helps me kind of root myself in where I am in my life. So yeah, I just write one quick sentence every day and you could do, you could write a lot of sentences if you wanted it. There's like a few lines, but the, but the point is, uh, you're just supposed to write one thing a day and, and, and you could do it about your kids. You know, you could do it about your battle with depression. You could do it about your, you know, your, your diet, or, you know, you could just do one that's sort of miscellaneous like mine, but I really like it. Uh, I, that's, I'm, I'm going to get that one. Like I saw that. I'm like, that sounds perfect. Cause I, it's th that and meditation never seem to work. You know, I always like make this big, I'm, I'm ambitious at the beginning yeah. and then it, it just always like falls to the wayside. But the journaling though, I know there's a lot of, you know, it, once you get into the habit, there's a, there's a lot of other benefits, the ancillary benefits. So um, you just motivated me again to, to try that again. Um, so let's talk a little bit about leadership because okay. we, we do that here a lot. Um, and from, again, like from, from the Stoics, right. And maybe from your new book, Lives of, of the Stoics have, what are a couple learnings about being a great leader? Is there something that that's not so obvious, not, not, I shouldn't say the sure. word obvious, but so, you know, we, we hear the same generic stuff all the time. Is there, is there anything that's a little bit more unique because you've, do you've dove so deep and leaned so deep into this stuff. That's yeah. a little bit. Yeah, I think I think what we're seeing right now, obviously, is just sort of a masterclass in what leadership yeah. should not look like. And I don't just mean that on the presidential level. I mean, like you look at the entire world and you could probably count on right. one hand, you know, the, the amount of leaders who have, have sort of risen to this 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 crisis. And, right. and um, I think I think the, the real core idea for the Stoics, this this predates them a little bit. They sort of make it their own. Um, you know, th th there's this uh, this expression: character is fate, or character is destiny. And and the the, the idea is, um, if 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 you're a shitty person, you might be successful in the short term, but eventually this is gonna mm -hmm. this is gonna prove to be your undoing. I'm sort of talking about this in my book. Ego is the enemy as well. Um, ego can masquerade as confidence and competence, but but ultimately, uh, in real crises or difficulties, you know, it, it, the truth is revealed. But I think for the Stoics, it Marx really says this great line, which to me is sort of the, has to be the motto of all leaders. He says, "Just that you do the right thing, the rest doesn't matter." The amount of leaders I've seen in this pandemic say things like. Um, 
whoa, we've got to go back to normal sometime or, you know, this could be really bad for the economy or, or you know, but, but my supporters don't like masks or, you know, a- any of this nonsense. Um, and, and what you never, what, what we're not hearing anyone say is like, this is going to be unpopular, but it's the right thing. Or they're saying like, this is going to hurt but it's going to be the right. I'm thinking, I'm seeing this with, with, uh, you know, uh, my own kids and whether we should send them to school or not. Some are, yeah. from, you know, that people are saying things like, but kids need school. And it's like, sure they do. Of course. But that's not what the question is. The question is, is it safe? And what is the impact on everyone else? Right. And so I think at the core, what leadership is about, it's not about success. It's not about accomplishing your goals it's what your obligations are, what your duty is as a person. And, and so, you know, Marcus really, it's, it, it's incredible to think in meditations, he speaks of the, the common good, something like 80 times over and over mm-hmm. again. He's talking about his obligation to other people, to, 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 to future generations, to, to strangers, to even people who don't, who not, who are not even a part of the Roman empire. And, and we seem to have lost the ability I don't even know any other way to say this. We seem to have lost the ability to give even two shits about other people. And to me, that's been the most egregious failure of leadership. At, even I was reading this article about some of the like the pandemic response teams. And it's like they were think that somebody actually said, oh, the virus seems to be hitting democratic states the worst. So this isn't that important. And like just uh, wrap your head around, you know, being uh, like a rising to a position of leadership and thinking that, you know, uh, life or death is a partisan issue. And, and so I think fundamentally the, with, with the Stoics uh, talk about leadership, that was inseparable from, from this sort of ethical duties of, of a good person. Yeah, I mean, there's a thought. I mean, where is the line between ego and confidence, right? They're not, they're, they're not synonymous with the same. No. You can be, right? Um, and do they ever talk about that, like the, the, their, the difference? Well, I think confidence is really important, right? If you don't believe you can do something, you're probably not going to be able to do it. Right. But just because you believe you can do something does not mean that you can do it, right? It's air. Okay. How about ar- like arrogance, ego, confidence? There's like, there, yeah. confidence is not the same, but you need to have some kind of arrogance to have that confidence sometimes to do. I mean, I don't know. Gonna- I mean, I, I, so, so, so Aristotle talks about the golden mean, and he says that that uh, that all virtues are a midpoint between two vices. And so he says, for instance, the the virtue of courage is halfway between uh, cowardice and recklessness, right? And I think I think mm, that's an interesting way to that. think about it. And so, if ego is on one end, and 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 sort of uh, ironically, I think. The ego of arrogance, like the the sort of Donald Trumpian ego, is Mm -hmm. actually, to me, very similar to the ego of like imposter syndrome. Um, The ego of like, in both cases, you're obsessed with other people and what they think of you, when in reality, people aren't thinking about you at all. Isn't that insecurity? So that type of ego, ego, egomania is more, it's it's stemmed in complete insecurity. But then most most people who are that egocentric are insecure and that's why they are acting that way. That's sort of my point. I think Uh, at the far ends of the extreme, it's, 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 it's insecurity, both directions. And so in the middle, confidence to me is, is self-awareness. It's an understanding of your strengths, but also it's an awareness of your weaknesses. And the reason this is so important, it's like if you're a boxer and you go into the ring thinking that you're perfect and you have no weaknesses, that's precisely where you're going to get hurt. Mm-hmm. If you go into, into the ring and you go, okay, I'm better than this boxer in these following areas, and I'm not as good in these following areas, and, and as a result, I've created a fight plan that allows me to leverage my strengths against their weaknesses, and I have a defense for my weaknesses. That's where you want to be. It's like, uh, if it, you know, if if you're if you were going up against Kobe Bryant and you knew that Kobe Bryant shot, you know, eighty percent when he went to his right and fifty percent when he went to his left, all you would know is that your job is to make him go to his left, right? Like so, so, so. What confidence is is not this delusional sense of your invincibility. It's a realistic sense of uh, of the world around you. Uh, Robert Greene, I think it's in. 
uh, 33 Strategies of War, he talks about, um, uh, he says, we have to take to reality like a spider in its web. And I think that's really the weakness of egotistical people is that they don't live in reality. They live in a right. fantasy land and, and that can work for a while. But eventually, you know, in this case, you come crashing up against a, a pandemic that doesn't give a crap about what you think. And then all of a sudden, you, you know, all your weaknesses are laid bare. And also like managing your emotions and anger. I saw that to be a big theme as well, right? Sure. Because uh, that could be someone's biggest downfall a lot of times. You know, you when you when you react d d badly, right? And it becomes like a you know a bad r ripple effect. Uh, yeah, I would, what did the, oh, go ahead. I, I would I would say it's like we don't all have anger problems, but anger is a problem for everyone. Like the, and, uh, Seneca has a whole essay, it's called On Anger, and he wrote it for the emperor Nero when Nero was a young boy before it was quite clear how, how deranged Nero was. But, it, but his point was that anger is the sort of most savage, most irredeemable of all emotions that it primarily injures the person who is angry, not the person that they're angry at. And that it's the sort of the root of, of of not just most evil, but also most most people's downfall. And mm -hmm. I, I think he's right. Um, I don't think when the, the Stoics are talking about anger, they don't have it. They don't have a temper. I think they just figured out how to conquer that. And, and it, it's a it's a you know, it's the work of one's life. It, it, it it's it's really being aware of the consequences that I, I mean, one of the things uh, we, we have a challenge called Tame Your Temper uh, for Daily Stoic. We talk about this, but um, it, one of the things you can do is just like just get out a piece of paper and just write down the things that anger has cost you in your life. You know what I mean? And and that mm -hmm. list gets pretty significant pretty quickly. You're like, well, I said this and then I got fired and I said this and then they walked out the door. And, you know, like you, you, very rarely do we look back at, at the, the role anger has played in our life. And we and we think I'm so glad I lost my temper. I, I you, you always regret it. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. Right. And that's a good, ta that's a, actually a good technique or a, a tactic to do, to write it down. What are some other things that uh, you learned from the Stoics that they did to control their anger, their temper, their emotions? So, so uh, I mean, I think this I is like that. That's very practical. So I like practicality. Thank you. This, yeah, this is kind of a cure all, <laughs> but I mean, one of the big Stoic exercises is, uh, is memento mori. Um, there's a Marcus. Surreal, I have. The, I carry this coin with me. But Marcus says that you know you could leave life right now. Let that determine what you do and say and think. And so one of the things, and and, and he quotes uh, the playwright Euripides. Uh, he says, "And why should you feel angry at the world as if the world would notice?" And I think his point is that if you realize you could die at any moment, if you realize that at some point you die and you're gone forever it sort of turns down the volume on not just everything, but it also makes your anger feel really silly and ridiculous. Yeah. You know? And and so that's, I always go like, why, why am I so mad about this? Like, first off, you know, your, 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 your heart's pumping like crazy. You're, you're, you know, shortening your life by however many seconds, every time you, you lose your temper. But, but second, you're just, you're just wasting time. Like you're, you're, you're so mad about this thing or this person and this person doesn't even know you exist, right? Like <laughs> the, the person who cut you off in traffic, they just weren't paying attention. They were not trying to harm you and they still don't even know that you're there. Do you know yeah. what I mean? And, and I, I think about that a lot. It's just like, what? I, we're both going to die. Who gives a shit? Absolutely. But what happens if it's something that's like, it's not the person on the street that they cut you off. Cause that's very trivial and silly, but sure. something that's much more, effective of your life like some somebody in your life that you are uh you know who's your business partner and they do something or whatever your, your co-worker whatever it is your husband your girlfriend whatever it is sure you know it, it can affect every type of relationship or any type of scenario it's not just in the in a in a you know flash moment when you're like driving on the 405 right yes yeah. Oh, I was going to say, like it's it's like those are the ways that you have to really try to figure out ways to control your emotions, your anger, because you know that's I feel that is that is a downfall that people that all of us have, right? Totally. And in stillness, I, I talk. I'm, I'm fascinated if people haven't watched it. Michael Jordan's Hall of Fame speech. Um, you you have the greatest basketball player of all time, and he goes up, 
and you think this is going to be this sort of crowning achievement, this wonderful moment where he, you know, he's like, oh, I remember, you know, the first basketball I ever got. And I remember my first pro game and I remember this. And, and, and he gets up there and he catalogs like every slight, every injustice. Yes, I remember. Everything I that's ever happened to him. And you're just like, whoa, if, if that's what winning looks like, count me out. You know, that doesn't look fun at all. Um, and, and so I think that's something to look at, too. And the Stoics, the Stoics, you know, being in clo- such close proximity to power sort of got some some insider access to this. If you've ever met a really successful but angry person, um, you sort of you realize like no amount of money in the world is ever going to make this person happy. They're still mad about getting cut from their high school basketball team or whatever it is. You know, they're still mad that their mom made them wear glasses or, or that, you know, <laughs> that, that they got, you know, la- laughed at in history class. And, and, and you just realize that what, what a place of profound pain, a lot of that anger is coming from and, and that it's, it's really self-inflicted. Yeah. Absolutely. I'm so happy you just said that Michael Jordan, uh, Hall of Fame speech because I totally it, I remember that so well and it was it was talked about a lot because I think it surprised like so many people right here's the best person that has ever played the game in the world and he was like he's such a perfectionist that he can't even get out of his own way of actually appreciating or seeing his his I guess his I, I guess the life that he's lived and like the the path his profession that he's done it's unbelievable and it just how you do one thing in life is how you do everything. It just, mm-hmm. I'm sure that's, that happens in his personal life. And like what, what also, what also you said, is I, I see it all the time that people who are billionaires who from the outside look like they have it all, they should be happier than anything. And they're the most miserable people, the most, you know, just they have no gratitude. They're unhappy. They, they, again, they, they are um, petty is the good word of it. Petty. Like Michael, that was, Michael Jordan was very petty in that thing, right? Yep. And 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 what I think is interesting is 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 so you go a lot of people they go, oh, so Michael Jordan was angry. That's what it takes. And and yeah, you're <laughs> this, this is just kind of a survivorship bias because you know, like so Robert Ori, uh, who who won a bunch of rings with the Lakers, a bunch of rings with the Bulls, I think uh one other team. No, he, I think he's won the most rings. I think he's won seven rings. No, but you, if you read about Robert Ory, no one's like, and Robert Ory is even angrier than Michael <laughs> Jordan. It just happens to be that Michael Jordan is an extraordinarily talented basketball player who's also nur- nursing a bunch of grudges. Do you know what right. I mean? They're, they're not related. And so, you know, Steve Jobs was the most brilliant CEO and sort of designer, product designer of all time. And he was an asshole. They're not right. the same. Like they're, they're really, if anything, treating people so cruelly um, harmed him and it held him back from being, Kanye West is not a great rapper because he's manic and, and, and uh, right. has a big ego. He's a, an incredibly talented artist and thinker and sensitive person who also has these demons over here. And sometimes they get all mixed up and and if anything, you know, it's it's prevented him from doing uh, great work, you know, better work. Right. No, I I totally agree. I, you showed me just before uh, a coin. Can, what what is on yeah. that coin? I want so, to see that again. Yeah. So uh, I'm sorry. You want to drink a glass of water? I keep on interrupting you when you're trying to like sip. So water. Okay. there's memento mori on the front, which means uh, remember you are mortal, and then it has the three facts of life, which appear in almost all the memento mori art that you see. So there's an hourglass, which is time, a skull, which is death, and then a flower, which is life. And then on the back, it just has the quote from Marcus Aurelius: "You could leave life right now." And the idea, and 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 um, in in most uh, sort of paintings of philosophers, you'll see a skull on their desk. The idea in the ancient world was life was so fragile; you could go at any moment. People wanted sort of reminders of their mortality. I, I have on my mirror in my bathroom. I have um, I bought it uh, from an antique store. It's a a broken off chunk of a tombstone from some Victorian grave. And the only word you can see engraved on it is, is the, it, it just says dad. Um, and, and, uh, and so the idea of having these sort of tangible reminders of how short life wow. is, 
is just a really powerful philosophical exercise. To me, it just puts everything in perspective, like in an instant. Do you, and you carry that around with you? So? I do. Yeah, I, I carry the coin uh, with me. Um, we sell them in the in the Daily Stoic store, um, but uh, but yeah, I carry one that that says uh, Memento Mori, and then in my other pocket, I carry one that says um, uh, that that has that lists the the four virtues of Stoicism, which are courage, self discipline, uh, uh, justice, and wisdom. I like that one. I like to get that kind of. I'd like to get that coin. Where where would I'll I get send, that? I'll, I'll send you. I'll send you one. Um, but uh, you promise? But I I promise. I promise. Uh, I'm going to hold I'm, you to that, Ryan. I'm, I'm, I'm right. I know where you lived. I'm writing it down right now. Um, it's uh, it, if you just go to store.dailystoic.com, we they, we have all the challenge coins there. Do you know what I notice? Also, there's not very many. There, not very many. There's only one woman I read about in this whole in this whole stoicism time, uh, philosopher time. And that was the daughter of Cato, yes. iron woman or superwoman. Uh, Cato, Cato, yes. Right, I got it, right? Yes. Um, I can't believe I remember that one. And she was the only one, Portia, and she was married to Julius Caesar and then Brutus, is that? Sort of, sort of. Uh, okay. I'll, I'll, okay, so, can you help? No, look, like when I sat down to biographize uh, all the, the major Stoic figures, it was obviously very, people tend to think Stoicism is, is just this kind of masculine thing and it's just for guys or it's only popular with guys. I, I know how big, how much of my audience is female. It's probably 50% or, or more so. Uh, and so it was really important to me that we, we have at least one female figure in it. But, but also within the, I didn't want to shoehorn in someone who wasn't actually sort of uh, yeah. stoic in the strict sense. So uh, unfortunately, you know, the ancient world was a man's world and there weren't many uh, stoic women. Uh, but but Portia Cato is fascinating for two reasons. One, she's Cato's daughter uh, and she marries Brutus and she and her husband, she doesn't get a, enough credit, but she and her husband conspired to kill Julius Caesar who, who had overthrown the Roman Republic and sort of most badass, um, uh, Brutus was afraid of telling his wife that he was thinking about killing Julius Caesar. And, and he wasn't he wasn't afraid to tell her because he didn't uh, want her to know. It's that in, in Rome, conspiracies, if you were if you were suspected to be con conspiring, they would they would uh, uh, examine you under torture. And, and so he, he was afraid that his wife. Uh, wouldn't be able to 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 or she suspected that he wouldn't wasn't telling her because he didn't know if she could in, hold out under torture. And so she famously stabs herself in the leg, doesn't tell anyone, binds up the wound, and just sees how long she can hold the pain uh, with without breaking under it. and And ultimately, this is why they end up conspiring together. Uh, and then famously, um, she she commits suicide rather than be killed by Caesar by swallowing hot coals, which is you know again pretty pretty inhuman. Um, but uh, the, the what's interesting is so she's like the main Stoic uh, female figure and and the main one that gets a profile in the book. But but uh, Musonius Rufus, who's one of the 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 later Roman Stoics, is very transgressive. In, in his own time, because he is one of the first philosophers to say that parents should instruct their children, both children, regardless of gender, uh, uh, in philosophy. And his argument is, is one, I, I, I only have two, I, I just have boys, but his argument is, is like, uh, you don't care what gender your dog is, like you want a, a great hunting dog, right? He's like, you don't care what gender your horse is, like you just care if it can do the job, and and his point is that like virtue, which is excellence, is right. is it has nothing to do with one's genitals, and 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 that it's that, that he says bo both both sexes are equally capable of and have the same inclination for virtue. So so look, the, the Stoics were by no means flawless on uh, when it, when it came to, to to sexism, but they were ahead of their time in that sense. So it's really important that she be in the book. What, what would be the what, one stoic or that you would say is the most underrated that people just don't know about that had, you know, that you that that you learned a lot of really valuable life lessons from? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, for, actually, I just remember to go back to the, the female question. One of the other things, uh, obviously, we, we close the book with Marcus Aurelius as the sort of last of the ancient stoics. 
But then I, I've just been writing some sort of like extra bonus stuff that's going to go out when the book comes out. But uh, on on modern Stoics, and and I ended up profiling Ariana Huffington, um, who people don't oh. it, first off is bo- born in Greece, is introduced to Marcus Aurelius in in high school. She goes to Oxford at like age sixteen. And she actually carries a, a laminated quote from Marcus Aurelius in her purse everywhere that she goes. So, 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 uh, you know, the idea that philosophy is this what? Sort of dusty thing just for men, it certainly doesn't hold up. Uh, so I thought you'd like that. No, I do. Is that, are you serious? I yeah. didn't know that. Yeah. She's, uh, yeah, she's great. Uh, I've gotten to know her a little bit over the years, but, uh, to go to your point she about, is, she's great. She is great. To, to go to your point about underrated Stoics, um, uh, you know, Musonius Rufus, who I mentioned, is fascinating. You know, uh, he's exiled four different times under four different emperors, um, partly because he, he has this nasty habit of speaking truth to power. But he has this great badass line sort of on his last exile. Um, he says, you know, you can take away my country, but you can't take away my ability to endure exile. And he's basically saying, like, like I ultimately have the power of choice to bear any fate that life throws at me. And so there's just this wonderful long history of, of the Stoics just, you know, dealing with the hardest, most difficult things you can imagine. And, and just, you know, they just keep on trucking. And I, I just love that about them. It's like resilience. I think it's resilience more mm-hmm. than that's the, the, the character trait that I would say that guy has as well. Besides, Absolutely. you know. That's yeah. a good one. What's his name? Mar- M- Musonius Rufus. How do you remember all of these names? I mean, honestly, like I do not. It's that's, very. That's, <laughs> it, it, that's it, why you have those four by six cards on you. Oh, so totally. And and look, like as someone who's kind of self-taught and and sort of primarily interacts with these people through the written word. You know, yeah. when you have to sit down and read an audio book, uh, you go, oh. I, I've never heard this word before. I have no idea how this name is pronounced. So actually, as soon as I, I get off this this interview, I have to go do a bunch of audiobook pickups where they, they're they like, you got this name wrong and you got this name wrong. I have to re-record a bunch of names. Oh, good. So I wasn't the only, I, I don't feel so bad that I call that guy cleanliness or whatever his name was, you know. No, it's Cleanthes, but. Uh, Cleanthes, thank you. Yes, the, uh, I mean, these are absurd, ridiculous names. So. Uh, maybe the reason I like Marcus Aurelius the best is that it's the easiest. I was going to say, you can you can actually say that name. Maybe that's right. why I like him the best, too. Maybe yeah. it has nothing to do with the whole habit thing and all his habits and, and excellence. And yeah, that's probably yeah. what it is. Um, what are like some final takeaways that you would like to leave, you know, your readers, the readers with or the by this audience here? Sure. Um, with from 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 your findings, from all your research with the Stoics, from your new book? Well, thank you. Yeah, I mean, I think those four virtues from the Stoics, it's, it, it, you know, Marcus talks about this. He goes, if you ever find anything better than courage, uh, self-control, justice, or wisdom, he says it must be pr- a pretty extraordinary thing indeed. And I think he's right. Th- th- that Those four character traits, those four virtues, that to me, that's the highest form of human excellence, right? Um, mm-hmm. And, and I, that's what we're, I think we're all trying to strive for in our own way. And, and so just this idea that, you know, the stoicism is a thing you do. You Obviously, you read about it and you can write about it and you can listen to podcasts about it or watch movies about it or YouTube videos about it, whatever. But the point is, ultimately it has to become a thing that you do. That's the whole point of it, that it, that it becomes an action. And so I think just realizing that is, is uh, you know, ultimately, I think that's the through line uh, of all my books is that you have to apply this stuff in real life. And did you, since, we, since you started taking this stuff extremely seriously and written, you know, copious amounts of books about them, have you, has, have, has your, have you changed? Like, have you actually, has your, has your mindset shifted a lot? Like you, beyond just using some practical you know, implication, uh, you know, it's a, it's, a, it's a process. I mean, nobody, nobody's perfect. And, uh, I, but I, I do try to give myself credit and go, how would I have reacted to this at 20? How would I have reacted to this at 25 at 30? How would I have reacted to this yesterday? 
And so to me, it's, it's am, are you making progress? I don't think it's that you magically transform yourself. I think, how do you make progress? And, and if you can keep making progress for as long as you live, uh, eventually, it, you know, we're talking about well-being is realized by small steps, but when you get there, it's no small thing. And so to me, I, I just kind of consider myself an ongoing work in progress and, and uh, I try to do a little bit each day. Wow. And so then this book comes out, what day does this book come out? September 29th. September. Uh, yeah, September. Lives, lives of the Stoics, right? Am I lives saying? Of the Stoics. The okay. art of living from Zeno to Marcus Aurelius. And then, but you're saying you're working on another book. So when does oh. that book come up? I, it's unbelievable. I, I, you're like a machine over there. Yeah. Just, that's, you that's, have a bunch of, you job. must have a, I mean, yeah, but I mean, and I also, I didn't even, even a, I wanted to ask you about this, but didn't you also ghostwrite a bunch of other books? I'm not going to mention names or anything, but yep. you also are writing a bunch of, so how do you have, to, like, how long does it take you to write a book? Um, you know, I think stillness, uh, stillness took about two years. Uh, lives took about two years, but those, those times can overlap a little bit. So I'm just always working. I mean, I'm, I'm probably halfway through the, th this book comes out in a month. And I'm about halfway through the draft, uh, the first draft of the next book. So I, I, I finish and I keep going. I finish, I start the next one. I finish, I start the next one. I just, I, we talked about habit and hustle. I think yeah. you, you guys show up every day and you can't stop. And that's how you build a body of work. And then how many, I'm just, this out of yeah. curiosity, how many actual hours a day do you write? Uh, I got to the office uh, at about eight thirty, and I was probably done with the like the hard hardcore writing for the day. Uh, I probably did about three hours. Three hours. Yeah. And you never have writer's block. Like, what happens when you get? Do you ever get that? I mean, yeah, certainly you, you can you can bump into to areas where it's not going as well. But to me, uh, writer's block is is just not having the material. So if you do the research, you'll always have something to write. Amazing. Well, I'm, it, it, you're just, you're amazing. A 33 year old, like how many, how many bestsellers you have now? We have like one, two, three, how many, you know, better I than think, I do. I think this is, ten, uh, this is book number 10. <laughs> I think this is 10. <laughs> amazing. Okay. So how do people find you if they want to learn about more of the daily stoic you, yeah. Ryan? We don't care if they know you, you said. You say you're not very interesting. Well, usually, so usually the best place to start if you're interested in the Stoic stuff and you want to just dip your toe in, I do a free email every day about Stoic philosophy that, that, that goes out to about 300,000 people each morning. And that's at dailystoic.com slash email. So that's that's the best place to start. But you can check out all the books on Amazon. And then also there's at Daily Stoic on Instagram. And then I'm uh, at Ryan Holiday. And you have a YouTube channel that has I all do. the videos. Yep. Don't forget about all those videos. We try to make a lot of stuff. I mean, uh, that's the point. You want to reach people where they are. You're making a ton of content. I don't know how like you have how you can like churn out a book this fast. I mean, literally, it takes people a year to have one book, and you have like ten, and you're six years old. Um, <laughs> well, thank you so much for coming Thanks on for Habits me. and Hustle. You're awesome, and um, good luck with this book. And I hope to meet you in person sometime soon. I would love that. Habits and hustle, time to get it rolling. Stay up on the grind, don't stop, keep it going. Habits and hustle, from nothing into something. All out, hosted by Jennifer Cohen. Visionaries, tune in, you can get to know them. Be inspired, this is your moment. Excuses, we ain't having that. The Habits and Hustle Podcast, powered by Habit Nest.